Welcome to this conversation with Roberta Smith and Lawrence Rinder about the art of Rosie Lee Tompkins, occasioned by the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archives retrospective exhibition of Tompkins' work. I'm Sherry Goodman, Director of Education, and I'll be briefly introducing our conversants, as well as Elaine Yao, who will be framing and moderating the discussion. Roberta Smith is co-chief art critic for the New York Times. She writes not only about contemporary art, but also the visual arts more broadly, decorative arts, popular and outsider art, and architecture and design. Many of you will have read Roberta's extraordinary review of the Tompkins exhibition. It's wonderful to have her with us today. Lawrence Rinder is Director Emeritus at BAM PFA and co-curator together with Elaine Yao of the Rosie Lee Tompkins retrospective. Among Larry's landmark curatorial achievements at the MPFA, from In a Different Light to Architecture of Life, in 1997, he organized the first ever one-person exhibition of Tompkins' work. Elaine Yao co-curated the Tompkins exhibition during her time as the museum's Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral curatorial fellow. She's currently the museum's associate curator for the Eli Leon Living Trust collection of African-American quilts. Elaine will set the stage for the conversation with a quick look through the Tompkins exhibition galleries. Following the conversation, there'll be time for your questions and comments over chat. Please submit throughout the program. I also want to be sure to let you know that the Tompkins exhibition will still be on view when the museum reopens, that date soon to be determined. And now I'll turn things over to Elaine. Terrific, Sherry, thank you so much and welcome everybody. Uh, Larry and Roberta, it's great to be with you in our virtual, around our virtual coffee table. Um, now I want to acknowledge that there's a little strangeness to this event to be talking about an exhibition that is, one is closed and one that not many of us probably has had a chance to see. Um, so before we dive into the conversation, I do wanna spend just a minute, a very brief minute or two, uh, going through some of the installation slides so we all have a common point of visual reference for the conversation ahead. So let me go ahead, I'll share my screen. So we are here to talk about Rosie Lee Tompkins and the retrospective organized by BAM PFA, um, really the first to celebrate uh, this tremendous gift from the collector, Eli Leon. I'll start very briefly to orient us in the opening gallery. And um, as many of you perhaps already know, Rosie Lee Tompkins was a quilter. She was born in 1936 in a very rural part of Arkansas and then made her way to California. This was her great migration journey, coming to the East Bay in 1958, where she would live and work for roughly the next four decades. But in this opening gallery, we've gathered together works spanning the 1980s. And really this was the decade in which she began quilting in earnest. And what we wanted to do here was gather together a group of quilts that show the sheer energy that she's bringing to this art form. So here is um, one opening look. And then turning around, um, you see again, more variety um, from this spectacular opening string quilt to other uh, checkerboard variations, as well as one of her signature velvet pieces. So just proceeding through this gallery, uh, the next rough grouping um, seeks to dive a little bit deeper in thinking about how she's repurposing materials and thinking about applique as a piecing technique, but also its adjacency to assemblage, which is another way of um, manipulating and arranging and composing with found materials. So just opposite that case, we enter um, a larger sequence of galleries looking at really thinking about um, her improvisational piecing practice. Uh, so the group of quilts to the right, which you see, um, we really wanted to put together quilts that explore her flexible treatment of borders, um, especially for the fundamental block, um, pardon me, the fundamental unit of quilting, which is the block form. So you see some broken, uh, broken and incomplete borders, as well as her really innovative treatment of the medallion, which is that central focal point. 
Now looking to your left, just beyond, uh, you see a trio of, um, of three spectacular velvet quilts. And now this really was her signature, um, her signature fabric um, and her preference in, um, in many of her quilts. And so these, so I just wanted to put these up and we have close-ups that we can pull up later in our conversation. Um, turning that corner, we have um, a more minimal and spare moment where she is um, really sort of paring down that explosive color that we see, um, that fra those facets of color that we see in the velvets and sort of bring bringing them down into a more elemental, um, elemental pieces. Another section of the exhibition wanted to focus on uh, the individuality that she developed throughout her body of work. Um, and to stand in for that, we have groupings of her very unique color palette. That's the orange, yellow, and purple that you see here. And this was a means through which she was endowing her quilts with personal symbolism. So sort of this next grouping, just to reorient us, um, leads us to the penultimate gallery, which on one side gathers together another group of abstract works, um, which have in common her use of metallic materials. And these are, um, this quality really channels her love of light and reflection. Um, and I think the, uh, the shine and metallic qualities of these quilts, which she called uh, her Christmas fabrics, uh, I think channel that sort of festiveness and that glittery um, feeling um, of the holiday. And then opposite the Christmas quilts, um, we sort of pivot from her, her explorations of pure abstract composition to her use of fabrics that contain images, what we've called um, her pictorial quilts. And these she, um, and in, the, in this group of three, you sort of see her making, um, thinking about sort of larger cultural statements in the way that she's manipulating um, the red, white, and blue of the American flag, which I hope comes through um, some of these uh, details. And then finally, the gallery, um, the ga this final gallery gathers together some of her late works, which as you can see, um, tend to be on a more intimate scale or more monochromatic. And in these, um, her deep interest in, um, in her, her Christian faith, her spirituality, and really her desire to commemorate members of her, uh, members of her family, um, both uh, distantly, um, both living in Arkansas, but also those who have since passed on, um, really come to the fore and form the basis for these later works. So that was sort of our, our speed run through um, of the exhibition. And um, I'll now turn to um, our conversation with our distinguished guests. Um, to jump right in, um, Larry and Roberta, I wanted to bring up sort of a thorny question, also I think a critique that um, BAM PFA's exhibition raises, and that is the comparison of quilts with painting, or another way of saying it is um, really thinking about quilts as, as an art form. Now I think, um, it's an uneasy comparison in some ways. One, it's it's common, right? It's, I think, um, quilts and especially abstract painting, there is sort of this invitation to compare them in a formal and visual sense. Um, but there's also, um, many people have flagged uh, the problem with doing that, which is, you know, you're sort of comparing apples to oranges, right? Using the criteria, dropping the criteria of quilts in order to compare them and put them on the same platform with paintings. And so my question to you is, even though we can acknowledge that differential, I wanted to invite your thoughts on what we gain from that comparison. So for example, what can quilts and paintings help us understand or how can we understand both mediums better through that comparison? Well, I'm not so interested in that distinction because I think that there are, there's a whole body of flat imagistic surfaces that are the pictorial arts. Paintings and quilts are among that. I think in many ways, ceramics is often among, among that. Wallpaper, all these things, we're sort of trained to look at images, things on flat surfaces. And um, I, I also think that 
in my case, I'm just going for the visual voltage, which I think for years I thought was sort of the domain of painting. But I don't think that is. It is. And I think it's, but I think that all the things that are sort of excluded from painting, what you have is they have to make their own case. Like you see a chair and you think, oh my God, that is art. Or you see a, anything, a, you know, a jar. It's if these things assert themselves as art, as equals to so called high art. And Rosie Lee Tompkins quilts did that for me in a way. I had loved quilts. Uh, but they did that with a force that I had never before experienced. And, you know, we can get into the whole thing about the surface of painting versus the surface of a quilt. I think the surface of a quilt is much more accessible because you can sort of see, you can see every stitch. You can, you can really rehearse the way it's made. And, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure paint, paintings do something else, but I, I see those quilts as really as a, her quilts as a challenge to painting, like be this good, be this powerful. Roberta, can you get into a little more detail about the kinds of expressiveness that the quilt medium or broad, more broadly speaking, the textile medium offers compared to painting in terms of the materiality? Well, that's it, it's the materiality. I just think that if you're quilting, you have a tremendous range of materials to choose from. You have, a, you know, Painters have different kinds of paint. They can put holes in their canvases. They have color, they have brushwork, or they have the absence of brushwork, or they can stick things to the surfaces. But, but Rosie Lee Tompkins had, and she, and she used very actively, I think that's one of the reasons we look at her, and that's what the, this show demonstrates. She used all these different kinds of fabrics, and she, she used her stitching as, you know, she uses different levels of skill. So, um, in some ways, after seeing this show, you know, when it opened in Berkeley, it was, I really thought, well, this is it, you know, painting really can't compare. Like, you know, you see one Barnett Newman, you've seen them all. I mean, you know, I know that's, that's sacrilege, but you, if you've seen one Rosie Lee Tompkins, you have not seen them all. Yeah. You know, you haven't, and if you think you've seen one Rosie Lee Tompkins, you haven't seen all of it. Because you could just go back and back and learn things about color combinations, shape, scale, the stitching. Yeah. I mean, just looking over these slides of the show that Elaine just saw, it's there's so much more I've seen getting ready for this than I remember seeing um, when I was out there. You just can't, I don't mm -hmm. think you can get, I don't think they finish for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think uh, I might be one of the um, perpetrators of the painting Rosie Lee Tompkins comparison in my essay for the 1990s show, I think I compared her to uh, Mondrian, which is kind of an obvious comparison, simply in terms of the composition, but only in for certain of her works. I mean, and one of the things that, uh, and obviously that has to do with the rectilinearity and the, the bright colors and so yeah. on. Um, but, you know, as Elaine, you and I were working on this exhibition, and other dimensions of her practice became, uh, you know, came to my awareness, like the objects, the decorated objects, or the applique, or the uh, just a different uh, sensibility began to emerge. And I began to see even those early works that for early for me, the uh, rectilinear geometric works in a different way. And that is not so much in the context of painting as in the context of collage and assemblage. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that if one was to sort of put her in any kind of art historical bucket uh, that we're familiar with, it would be that one. And it's a tradition that I think, you know, I'm, people have probably been putting things together artistically for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. But I really see a, a, a good starting point in terms of kind of a history of artistic practice and a context to put her in with someone like Schwitters. And if maybe you could put up the, uh, uh, the slide with the, sure. the Schwitters and the uh, uh, Rosie and the Lonnie Holly. Uh, so kind of bracketing in a way the 20th century, um, I think on the one hand, you've got someone like Schwitters, who was early 20th century, a uh, German artist working in collage, found materials and putting them together in a very personal, uh, emotive, affective way that at the same time drew on uh, his experience as a painter and on contemporary painting practice and ex explorations of form. 
Uh, and then at the other end of the 20th century, 2011, well, I guess into the 21st century, we have someone like Lonnie Holly, uh, also, I think, a master uh, collage slash assemblagist, uh, who in a way is kind of the sculpture version of Rosie Lee Tompkins to me. I think he pulls together, uh, using found materials, the same kind of affective, emotive, spiritual, personal energy that Rosalie Tompkins does with quilts, he does with objects. Mm -hmm. And I happen to find this one particular piece, Gabriel's Horn, which conveniently uh, is a quasi two-dimensional piece with the pieces arranged in a, uh, against this kind of background grid. And then you can see in the middle there, a piece of Rosie Lee's, and you can see that it's uh, you know, not too distant from both of these uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. And, and I think um, what, what connects them is not just the fact that they're using found things and sticking them together. It's the way that they're doing that in the, in the modality of personal, spiritual, symbolic expression. Every piece of material in all of these three artists' work has symbolic meaning and is at the same time itself. So they, are, they have this kind of incredible ability. It's their, it's their genius, if we can use that word, not that they're geniuses, but this is their oh, genius, yeah. to uh, maintain a balance between the thing and its meaning, uh, the material qualities of the thing and what it symbolizes or stands for are both held in perfect balance. Um, so that's, that's where I'm seeing her now. If I had to uh, teach an art history course, that's what I, well, that's where I'd place her. I still think you have degrees of wall power. You know, you put a Rosie Lee Tompkins up next to a painting, you're gonna be looking at what they do or feeling what they do. Yeah. But I totally agree. And that's, that's one of the advantages of her technique over painting is that they all have, these pieces all have meaning, but they also have an element of recognizability for the viewer mm -hmm. so that you can kind of go along and see like, oh, well, that's a dish towel, or this is a feed sack, or this is velvet, which catches light in certain ways. And there's just so much that she takes from the culture at large, you know, mm -hmm. like the California quilt, which has souvenirs sewn into the surface. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I totally uh, agree with that. Yeah, let's take a look at that California uh, quilt if we can. Mm -hmm. uh, which isn't, uh, strictly speaking, a quilt at all. Uh, I don't think, well, maybe she, did she quilt this one, Elaine? Um, yes, she did. Okay, so this is maybe a good uh, moment to pause. Uh, apologies for a little bit of a technical clarification. Uh, we speak of all of her work, maybe with the exception of objects as quilts, although technically speaking, uh, the, uh, the only ones that are quilts are ones that have a backing sewn on to them. And not all of her works have the backing sewn on. Um, the quilting in the world of quilts is the, uh, the act of sewing the backing on. And she was not all that interested in the back. She was interested in the front, what's called the pieced top. The pieced top. Mm -hmm. And this piece, uh, this work, is actually an applique uh, and embroidery. So you see there's a, she started with the red ground and then added all those little found elements along with some embroidery and ultimately did add a quilted back, which she did herself. Uh, the majority of her works were actually quilted, technically speaking, by other people. Um, so that's just a little technical aside. But Roberta, can you talk a little bit more about this piece and what you uh, think of it, what you love about it and how it's, uh, you know, maybe, yeah. Well, this, for me, this gets absolutely right by collage, which you, which you bring up, which is that uh, disparate pieces of material are affixed to a single background. And there are all these recognizable things where she sort of put together, like, here are some, uh, I forget what they're called, but anyway, these are, are different kinds of um, Come on, guys, help me out. <laughs> they're not rattles, they're musical instruments. Oh, maracas. Oh, the maracas, the maracas. Oh, sorry, thank you. And then some of these things like this, this is a necklace right here. And these are doilies. Right. One is a doily, this is probably a handmade doily. And this is trim, this is right. bob, misspelled. You know, this is just somebody's name, bits of lace, then she puts in her name. Then she has what I think is the back of, of a Mexican jacket, which was 
when I was growing up was kind of a fashionable thing. You would find them in antique stores and they had these elaborately embroidered images on the back. And, and you're thinking, speaking of this portion here. Yeah. With, right so there. this is a kind of, there's a whole kind of weird, somewhat multicultural thing going on in here, I think, where she's acknowledging this is a, a Mexican image of American Indians, you know, and um, I don't know, there's just, there's just so many things. Well, there, basically, there's a lot of, I think, I can't remember, but there's a lot of decorated trim, like this is sequins. Yeah. That's um, right, right around here. Yeah. These longer strips. Yeah, and um, you know, people in the audience might be interested to know, and we talk about this in the catalog, but it's um, the reverse of this particular quilt has um, a tag that she is stitched into the back, which actually says my own design. And mm -hmm. so I think that that real like ownership of her, um, of her aesthetic and her approach mm -hmm. is, we begin to see it and it's stated very clearly in this, in this work. So speaking of uh, aesthetic approaches, there's one of the striking things about Rosalie Tompkins is this kind of duality or tension between works like this, and this is maybe a, an extreme example of the kind of chaotic Rosalie Tompkins, where it's hard to discern the rhyme or reason. I think there is an underlying order uh, for her, but it's a little bit hard to discern compared to uh, other works that have a very uh, kind of regimented relatively regular structure. And Elaine, maybe you can go ahead to the so-called, you know, the minimal uh, room to give an example of that, that kind of, um, yeah. uh, the other, the, you know, maybe this is the Dionysian and then the Apollonian uh, is this kind of thing. So, um, and I think, you know, one of the things that's striking about Rosalie Tompkins is even in works like this, where you have this kind of Donald Judd-like regularity, they still, are, for lack of a better word, jazzy. They're like popping, they're jumping, they're, uh, they're moving. Uh, and she was able to maintain that dynamism across these different uh, idioms. Um, one of the ways in which I, you know, in working on this, this show recently with you, Elaine, uh, the body of work of hers that I became familiar with, which I, which I hadn't known about at all before, are the embroideries, where she is embroidered onto the, the quilts. And I wanted to ask Roberta about this because in works like these, the ones we're looking at now, uh, the, the minimal works, you know, you could uh, hypothetically speak about those in terms of the formal language of painterly abstraction um, or even sculptural abstraction, Donald Judd Mondrian. When you get to something like this, where she's working with this embroidered uh, text or in the, the other one, Elaine, with the, uh, the black, red, blue, and green one um, yeah. here, where there's an order to the, the colors and shapes, but the embroidered text does not appear to have any kind of formal um, rhyme or reason. I wanted to ask you, Roberta, what you make of the embroidery uh, aesthetically, what role you think it plays, how, how do you make sense of it in turn, artistically in her work? Well, I sort of see it as drawing and I don't, she's not really, she, she, I mean, the thing about her is this kind of great thrown together, together energy that so many of her pieces have. This is a small, smallish quilt and it certainly has that. Um, but she, she embroidered, I think with these kind of little X's, right? That's what it is. I can't quite remember, but they're, they're, they're just, she just had to do it. So she did it. And, and I remember somebody said that some of her friends in quilting circles used to say, well, we should really teach her how to sh sew, you know, because she wasn't seen as the most skilled. And I think that certainly uh, shows in the embroidery. And I think it adds this great energy, this kind of impatience and uh, a need to communicate. And that's, that's, that's sort of wild to use the word that you use. Mm -hmm. And this is one of my favorites. I mean, this looks, I think this is a dress, right? I always thought this was like the dress that a, a flapper might have worn, you know, and she's, uh, she's made it into this kind of roof or forest. And then these little, the, in this, they look like hands. So that's like, you know, a, a saint or the Madonna opening mm -hmm. her hand. Mm -hmm. And then here are other ones where they become like 
part of nature. And then these are these are like pooty to me, like little angels flying mm -hmm. around these um, mm -hmm. rhinestone details. Yeah. I love that word you, you use, urgency, because I think it does get to the heart of the embroidery and its kind of function uh, artistically in these works, that it really underscores that, that sense of, of urgency, that she's, on the one hand, got, you know, almost total or maybe even total mastery of the colors and the shapes and all of that. And she can, working with those alone, you know, pack a wallet. But there's even more. You get this sense with her work. It's like this unending cornucopia of energy and inspiration. And that even moreness comes out in the embroidery. Like it's right. just a layer. But, uh, and also it. in the references, you know, because yeah. she puts these, she's thrown these black crosses across the surface. So then it becomes kind of a landscape and these become maybe tombstones. I mean, it becomes very, it, her work is very suggestive pictorially, I'll use that word. Um, and as, as well as just in terms of being a handmade flat thing. I mean, you've mm -hmm. said that before about one of the big velvets with the, mm -hmm. the little tiny pearls on black velvet making it look like a night sky. Oh yeah, yeah, you know? right, exactly. You know, this particular piece, uh, I can't help but see it as uh, Calvary, Mount, uh, you know, the mountain, the little hill where Christ was crucified. To me, that's what that dress piece at the bottom uh, comes to. I mean, I don't know if that's what it is, but that's how I read it. But I can, I also see now, which I hadn't really noticed before, those hands reaching down as a kind of benediction. I think that's really uh, very beautiful. Um, yeah, right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you go to the back to the green one, Elaine? Sure. So this one's just extraordinary. And this is one that Elaine and I came across in uh, looking through all the works in the Eli Leon collection for the show. And it's just, you know, here she's dispensed with everything except the, the material, the underlying material and the um, embroidery. And I think it's one of very few pieces where she does this. And um, I don't know, Roberta, I'd, I'd love to know your take on, on this piece. I, I can't, you know, when looking at this, I can't help, my mind immediately jumps to Cy Twombly. It's kind of an easy comparison, um, but I don't know, maybe something there. It's not, uh, I'm not trying to sell a new art history in that comment, but it's just a feeling I get. I'll take Twombly. Also, there's certain outsider artists who do a lot of writing like, um, whose name I'm not going to remember right now. Dave Miller, a Miller, I oh, think. Oh, uh, John Patrick McKenzie. Him too. Um, <laughs> but oh, and this yes, is just uh, Dan her, Miller, right, yeah. This is just her sort of putting the information, putting mm -hmm. two levels of information out. She's got all, here's her name across the top, Effie Mae Howard, which is her real name. Rosie Lee Tompkins was a name she made up to protect, that was made up to protect her privacy. And this is her birthday, September 6, 19, 6, 1936. And then she sort of counts a little bit, 36. And she goes 69, 70. She counts in a lot of, a lot of the embroidery. And these are various addresses of where she lived. This is Gould, Arkansas, her birthplace. And then she starts putting in biblical references. So, you know, like this is where you could have found her and this is where you can find certain things in the Bible, although we don't know if her numbers are necessarily verses. Sometimes she just makes up the numbers. So no, I like I think this is something that straddles a lot of uh, a lot of different bases. I mean, you could also talk about it in terms of like abstract expressionist all overness. I mean, you know, it's just um, I wasn't that crazy about this when I first saw it. I have to say. Mm -hmm. But I've come to like it a lot. And it's not backed, right? It's just the top. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's interesting that she, it wasn't backed. Yeah. Because if it had been backed, it would have been a different kind of object yeah. altogether. And the writing would have sort of been absorbed into it more mm -hmm. and would have been competing with the, the quilting going across or up and down mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. So, um, if, can I interject just for a moment? Please. Um, I think we're at a good point where before too much time runs out, I do want to... Um, shift to another set of questions, um, which concern the history of African-American quilting as a tradition. And I'd like to pose this uh, question to the both of you, which is how important 
is an understanding of quilt technique and sort of this larger cultural history to, full, to the full appreciation of these artworks. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share so we can see us. Before I answer, can you just go back to that once? I just have to point out this one thing. It's just a thing that <laughs> I love. Is it the, the green one, Larry? The green uh, one? Yeah, the green one. Okay, okay. So, so as Roberta was saying, you got her name, you got her addresses, you have the biblical references. And then right as sort of a, a two thirds down, you have the sentence that comes out of nowhere. I don't think it's in the Bible. Love is like an ice cream cone. It gets better with each lick. Right. And then she goes back, goes back to biblical references. So I just love that. Uh, she had a sense of humor uh, and it comes up in, in a lot of her work and uh, it's something to, to attend to. So, um, you know, I do think that an understanding of uh, Quilt, te quilt technique and African-American quilting culture is important uh, to understand the whole story and the whole picture. Uh, and it's incredibly enriching to the way that we see these works. Um, it's been really eye-opening for me to learn more about quilts and African-American quilting culture. When I first saw Rosie Lee Tompkins' work, I knew none of nothing about that. And they struck me initially simply as marvelous things. And then I began the, uh, you know, the journey uh, to discover more about the context. Um, so on the one hand, yes, uh, it is enriching and important. Is it absolutely necessary? I don't think so. I think there's something about these works that, um, you know, make themselves available to anybody, whether they have that knowledge or not. There we call them universal. But right, anyway. I want to avoid using that word. I know, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I agree. I mean, you know, there's certain things that just speak to a lot of people immediately. And I would say blues is one of them. And uh, these quilts are another. And they're, they're, they certainly come out of a very specific African-American culture. Um, and they're different. I mean, but they're also there's no emblematic style. You know, the context is, may have certain continuity, but I mean, Eli, the, who we'll get to later, sort of wanted to, to posit that this kind of intuition and improvisation was unique to African-American quilts. It may not be that, that widely used among, you know, ang what he called Anglo quilts, but there are also many different styles of African-American quilts other than right. this. Right. But yes, I think the more you know, the more interesting it gets. But I want to start with just loving it, mm -hmm. you know, because that's your motivation for, for learning the, more about it. Yeah. Uh, so, Roberta, you sort of pointed out this uh, theory or collection of theories that, that Eli had about, about the work. And uh, Elaine, maybe we can jump to that last slide, uh, the comparison. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, Eli Leon, the collector, um, was very interested in and promulgated a, a theory that uh, Rosie Lee Tompkins and indeed the work of a lot of African-American quilters came out of a kind of a direct um, uh, cultural, um, kind of a cultural intuition uh, that he, Eli Leon, traced back to the style of certain textiles in Central Africa, particularly the Kuba and Bakuba um, textiles. And here you see a comparison. And I think this comparison is actually made in one of his books between an African textile from Central Africa and one of Rosalie Tompkins quilts. Other scholars like Robert Ferris Thompson uh, agreed with this and there are others who said, no, that's poppycock. So, uh, you know, but it was really Eli's motivation in collecting to kind of prove this thesis. Um, so that is another context to, to look at, but uh, it's, a, it's a huge question and, uh, and uh, um, would take a lot of time to, to dig into that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And maybe just to follow up on that very briefly, Larry, I think um, what Eli's life's work really did was, um, I think he was, he was trying to validate this, this approach of quilting, this improvisational approach, which I think during the time that he was collecting and, um, and, you know, and actively exhibiting and writing, which, you know, um, 
wasn't really um, well understood or even regarded in, I would say in both the quilt world and I'll say that very tentatively, but then also um, within, within the larger art world as well. Um, so yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. Um, Roberta, I'd love to ask you a question. Um, we're sort of related to this topic of um, the, the history and you know, sort of the field of practice as it relates to African-American quilting, because um, you ended your New York Times review on sort of this very hopeful note um, that, you know, suggesting that there, there are probably many more um, fantastic, tremendous quilters and artists in textiles out there. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what excites you about that prospect? Um, and do you think that there are many more artists of the stature of Rosie Lee Tompkins that we have yet to discover? I would be dumbfounded if there are many more artists of the stature, um, because she, I think she's so fabulous. I remember one time, you know, when I came out to the opening of the show, it was like so intense. It was such a high because I'd never seen her quilts on walls. Barely, you know, except for like the Whitney Biennial had three on walls, I guess the Biennial Larry organized. I had never seen so many quilts of her work and, and nor had you or Larry, although you, I guess you'd pick through them, but you'd never seen them up. And it was just, I was sort of high for two days and I don't, I, I think you guys were too. And I remember at one point being in the exhibition and Larry and I passed each other and I said, or one of us said, this is, she's the greatest artist ever. And the other person saying, yes, I mean, we were, we were sort of intoxicated, but it, you know, it just seemed to beat out everything in the midst of it. But I, I can't believe that she could be unique, you know? I mean, she, there, there should be a few more at that level. I mean, because look at, look at Delta Blues, for example, look how many geniuses come out of that. That's like, that's a virtual renaissance in terms of music, you know, in yeah. terms of great uh, musicians and songwriters and everything. So why shouldn't there be uh, an equally impressive group? Yeah, you know? I, I think there is. And I think Eli collected a lot of them. I think, yeah. uh, you know, we luckily got this collection now at the museum. We have decades to dig into it. And I think that we are going to find that there are other artists in uh, you know, with a different voices, uh, different approaches, um, maybe, maybe not ultimately at, at you know, Rosalie Tompkins, uh, whatever that special spark is that she has, but still uh, really great and uh, impressive as quilters, as artists, everything. Um, yeah. And I, I, to get to this, I think the second part of your question is this is really profound in terms of the history of art, the history of American art. And it's part of a kind of expansion that I think has been going on for, I would say now 50 years when the first outsider artists were discovered and they started to be absorbed and appreciated, which is basically arts going on all the time, all around us. And some of it is really good. And it just makes the kind of canonical, small canonical group of in the linear progression shrink, you know? I mean, I knew from the minute I saw this work that this was gonna have to, like, I was gonna have to factor, like how did this compete with Jasper Johns or something? Cause I just, for me, it was just like on the same level if, if a different sensibility. But that, I think that's really such a great thing to understand and that, no, you know, it hasn't been monopolized by any group of people, by any medium. You know, it's happened all over this country. And in a, maybe in a different way than in Europe because so many parts of this country didn't have anything. So people made these things. Um, so many people didn't have anything. And it's completely different. There wasn't, there wasn't a culture and everybody contributed to it. Absolutely. No, thank you. And I, I'll just add for myself, yes, that is um, sort of given my own work in thinking about vernacular artists, you know, as sort of the least charged term for them. Um, exactly what you're saying, great art can come from so many places, 
Roberta. Yeah. I really appreciate that, that statement a great deal. Um, I wanna ask just um, one more question before we turn to uh, the Q&A. And, um, and this is sort of both you, Larry and Roberta have, um, you know, the personal, the personal component of how you came to Rosie Lee Tompkins, I think so often um, is included in reviews and in, um, you know, articles about your work, your history with Eli and with Rosie Lee Tompkins. Um, so Roberta, maybe I'll just turn to you first. Um, what, what, I, what I found really striking about your review was how much personal recollection was a part of your, um, of your text. And so I'd invite you just to speak a little bit about that decision to write in that way um, and why you felt that was appropriate. Well, I didn't really have any choice because I, Eli pulled me into it. You know, I mean, basically I stumbled across Larry's 1997 show. That was when we met. I mean, I was just like walked in and I was gobsmacked and I was sort of like asking the person at the desk a lot of questions and she sort of like, hold on, hold on, I'll call the curator. And so Larry came down and we both, I have no idea what we said, except that we both agreed she was great. And so I left with this experience. I barely, it barely had like visual detail. It was just like a blast. And then, and so I, you know, then a few years later, like 15 years later, I still knew about her. She'd been in Larry's biennial and, you, and I would talk about her to people like, do you know? I remember the last time I was out at SF MoMA, I was introduced to Max Holine. And I said, do you know you have a really great artist whose work is uh, completely <laughs> concentrated on the other side of the bay? You know, and it's like, oh, okay, <laughs> I didn't hear back. But um, so she was always in my mind because I, I was already aware of all these great vernacular artists, whatever you want to call them, I'm fine with. But, you know, Martin Ramirez, um, Bill Trailer, uh, Henry Darger. Yeah, Joseph yeah. Yoakum, you've mentioned. Joseph Yoakum, yeah, just, so I was, all, I thought, well, it could come from this direction, and I kept waiting for something to happen, and then Eli called, uh, and I evidently, he called lots of people. I don't know how, how many of us showed up, but I went to see him, and I sort of got the enormity of, of her work, and of his passion for it. And, and at that point, I, you know, Larry knew about it. So I thought, okay, Larry will, I mean, we all used to kind of worry what would happen. And then we didn't know that Eli had actually taken care of it and left the, because the, Eli would, would approach everybody with, what am I gonna do with this collection? Like, I want a consortium of museum, you know, museums to take it over, or then he'd say, oh, I want it to go in one place. And you would just be overwhelmed because you knew that you were talking to a man in a house that was, you know, had thousands of quilts stuck in everywhere. And it just seemed so enormous. You could barely, you, you couldn't really bring it up to people. Like, what are you going to do with a house full of 5,000 quilts? You know, like you go to the Met. There, it, it's just terrifying. So he got over. So somehow it happened that that because of Larry and the proximity of Berkeley and that it all went there and it's just so totally appropriate you know um I mean I think they should be dispersed but that's another that's another job you know it's another chapter yeah. I think they should be all over the country and in, in groups and museums yeah that's what I had been talking with Eli about. I was helping with him, you know, helping him uh, towards the end of his life, kind of think about what museums might be appropriate, how one might divide the work into buckets and how to make the offer and so on. And it came as a total surprise to me when I got the call from his attorney after he passed that uh, all the work was coming to Berkeley. I had never mentioned Berkeley as a possible place for the work. We purchased uh, one of the quilts some years ago. So we had a great one in our collection, but very few other textiles in the collection. And textiles rec require a particular kind of care and storage and conservation. And so mm -hmm. it just seemed impractical and, you know, insane to say, well, you know, give Berkeley a lot of them because we didn't have the means to really take care of them. Now we're going to have to figure out how to take care of them. And I want to give a shout out to the Luce Foundation for giving us a really great 
uh, grant to kind of kickstart that process of conserving and uh, storing the works. It's gonna take a lot more resources, but we've got it uh, going. Um, Roberta, I wanna ask you, you were in Eli's house, uh, I guess to see Rosie Lee Tompkins work and he probably hung them up in his kitchen or someplace. Yeah, the clothesline. Yeah, the clothesline in the kitchen. Did he show you works by any other artists? Did you see anything else there that caught your eye? Um, not really. I mean, he showed me some of his catalogs and they, I was aware that there were other artists involved. Yeah. But um, I mean, and I know there's some that, that seem pretty close to her in terms of the quality of their work. Yeah. So, so that's like a whole other area because the majority of the quilts what did you get? 3,000. 3,000, more mm -hmm. or less. Uh, so like three quarters of that or something, some fraction, some pretty big fact fraction are not by her. Right, about that's what, 500. That's what makes it so interesting. Like Yeah, about 500 plus or minus uh, are by Rosalie Tompkins. So 2,500 are, are by other artists. There's over 400 different artists in the collection, going back to the 1830s or 40s and up to, you know, shortly before he passed. And he has a, an awful lot of the, the woman in Texas. Um, uh, Laverne Brackens, yeah. um, Gladys Henry. He has, a, yeah. he has like a couple hundred of hers, I thought, or something. Yeah. That's yeah. right, yeah. So he's really, you know, it's, it's a brilliant thing or whatever it was that drove him, his ideas, his obsessions. You yeah. Know, um, yeah. Um, I, let me just in, interrupt. Pardon me, Roberta. Just so um, I want to, you know, because sort of what we're talking about now in terms of both like Eli and the his collection uh, more broadly, I think um, begs the question that I think probably many in the audience are thinking, and I see one or two questions coming through now, which is, um, you know, now BAM PFA's role in the disposition of the collection. Um, and it seems like, especially in this moment where many cultural institutions and art museums in particular, you know, are being called to task to be introspective and in thinking about their position, especially within uh, the history of the US and institutional racism, systemic injustices, um, both political and economic. Um, would you just offer some of your thoughts about how BAM PFA can um, address some of these and how the collection itself is an invitation to address yeah. these well, issues. I think, go oh, Larry, go ahead. All right, I'll, I'll be quick because I want to hear what you what you have to say about this. Um, you know, I think it's an extra, obviously an extraordinary collection. It's probably the largest collection of African-American quilts in the world, maybe the largest collection of African-American art in the world um, that I'm aware of. And not only that, there's this quality that it's just exceptional. Eli was a connoisseur, so it's an amazing collection. The fact that it'll be in Berkeley to be studied, um, enjoyed, uh, you know, just digested over time, inspiring other people for decades, that in itself is, you know, I think a huge contribution to American culture and, and art history. Um, I, I agree with Roberta. I think it would be great if, some of these were actually elsewhere, maybe on extended loan or I don't know, you know, it just seems that if MoMA had six great Rosie Lee Tompkins, that would move the needle faster than if Berkeley has 500. Um, so, uh, you know, and, you know, we do have about 500 of her quilts of which, you know, about 70 are in this exhibition. So there's a lot. Um, yeah, anyway, I think that's all I have to say for now. Roberta, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think of it as totally tipping some kind of balance in terms of art historical concentration, you know, like this is going to attract a lot of different kinds of scholar. I mean, scholars, it gives Berkeley a whole, it re, I think it, I mean, I don't know, what do I know? I feel like it redefines Berkeley for sure, you know, and it should be seen that way by the university. And, um, and it redefines you know, again, the number, it redefines American art history because of its size and quality. It's, it's just incredibly important. Um, mm. And I think there should be a building for it and, you know, definitely tenured art historians for it. And 
yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. people getting their PhDs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you both. Um, I'm gonna turn now to some of the Q&A because I certainly, I want to leave some time for that. Um, I do see there are a couple of questions that we can quickly answer. One audience member asks, um, what are some of Eli's books? Um, some titles you might wanna look up um, accidentally on purpose is sort of kind of calls together his his uh, his life's research in one mm -hmm. volume and it has some really gorgeous illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, Who'd have thought, thought it, it was one of his right the I think it's a 1987 exhibition that was first um, shown at the San Francisco uh, Folk and Craft Museum. Um, some, uh, let's see, something pertaining to God is the catalog of Rosie Lee Tompkins' um, later works, and especially the embroidered text um, that Eli organized at the Shelburne Museum in Vermont. Right. So, um, I, I would point, point you all to some of those titles. Um, there was a question about what the reception was like for Rosie Lee Tompkins' quilts when they were made. Um, so Larry, I think that Larry Roberta, that would put us in the 80s and 90s, early 2000s. Maybe Larry, you can speak to that having curated mm -hmm. the show. Yeah, well, you know, uh, she was uh, a very private person and she personally was not all that interested in exhibiting the work. The works were actually made for herself and often for other people. Uh, sometimes she'd give them to other people, but in a way, maybe more profoundly, they were made spiritually for others. So she would have someone in mind when she was making a quilt. They were like uh, um, prayers, if you will. So from her perspective, I think the reception of the work would have been on that kind of very personal uh, spiritual level. And hopefully they worked and the prayers worked, whatever she was hoping for happened as a result of making the quilt in terms of like art world reception. Um, you know, um, I'm not sure if the show that I did at Berkeley was reviewed, the show in the nineties. And I don't recall, um, any review of the biennial calling out the, the uh, quilts. Roberta, you'd know if, if you did, but I, I just- were, well. I mentioned them, but somebody, I, I think a couple of people called them the best paintings in the show. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> interesting. Um, you know, she's sort of slowly developed a very ardent following in the artwork uh, as a result of shows like the show at the Shelburne and the Folk and Craft Museum and so on. Um, but it's been a slow, a slow burn, a slow development. And, um, but I think that that's changed now, I hope. And she's very well known in both worlds because the quilting yeah. world is not, you know, they overlap, but they're not the same worlds by any yeah. stretch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Um, I have another question, which I think um, is one that, I've, that I often ask myself is, how would you contextualize her work with the quilts of G's Bend? Yeah, well, the quilts of G's Bend are phenomenal, obviously. Um, uh, really just an, you know, an astonishing array of, of talent in that small community in Alabama. Um, and looking at Eli's collection broadly, and you know, maybe Rosalie Tompkins in, in particular within that context, it's like all the other towns, right? So G's Bend is not an, an anomaly. Uh, there were lots of towns throughout the South and the Midwest indeed, and, and also on the West Coast, thanks to the Great Migration and the Northern Midwest, where artists, you know, often working together, but not always. Rosalie Tompkins, for example, did not generally work collectively. She worked in, you know, in a solitary way, but in any event, working out of that culture produced amazing art. So the Eli Leon collection in aggregate is like all the other G's Bends. Um, he actually, there was nothing in the collection from G's Bend itself, but those people who are familiar with the G's Bend quilts will recognize certain stylistic idioms and uh, techniques in some of the quilts uh, in Eli's collection. Yeah, I think it's important to point out that, I mean, she, a lot of the materials she used were new. And part of the, part of why, what makes G's Bend so often so great, and I don't, I don't think it's totally, but that, that they're reusing things and that there was a real, these things were really used the clothes that went into them were already worn. And that makes us, that creates a certain look, I think. 
And yeah. they also had an amazingly bold scale, have an amazingly bold scale. And she's really about a kind of inter intricacy, you know, where she takes the triangle, the what's it called, the half square triangle, mm -hmm. and on a single quilt, she'll make it this big or she'll make it that big, mm -hmm. you know. That's a, a square made out of two triangles, and it's the it's the basic unit mm -hmm. of quilt language. And she does crazy things with it. So just just follow the split the split squares and the, and the two triangles that make it up. And mm -hmm. yeah, well here you can see it go to, you know, this is a very large one right here. And then she confuses things by putting it back to back there. And then she gets a bit smaller here and here it's really tiny, but there's also these, these all these irregularities in her work, not only of color, but just of, of scale and things. They just create, as she, like here's the, maybe this is the tiniest right here, but they're just- Where are you, Roberta? Are you in the blue? Can you see my cursor or is that, am I the only no. one who can see my cursor? You're the only one. <laughs> yeah, only you. Rats. <laughs> rats. Okay, well, I would start it out down here with this big, very clear, uh, half square triangle right here, this blue and black one. And then I was just wandering all over the, particularly in the borders where the borders right. here really are like separate quilts. They, they have borders of their own. Um, and then they, they go down to right below, I think it's right below the blue and black field. I think it's the smallest the uh, triangles you're gonna find in this quilt. But there you go. she, so she's interested in these in disrupting scale, but it never gets to that kind of boldness where you, with G's pen, you kind of see them across the room, I think. And they have these big, um, yeah. this tremendous on, scale. On the other hand, her largest quilts, I'm pretty sure are larger than the largest G's Ben quilts. I mean, Rosalie Tompkins was often utterly unconcerned with the dimensions of a bed. She was not making bed coverings. So right. we have some quilts that are, you know, 15 feet long. I mean, right. just like, it's something else. I don't know what it is, but it's something else. It's, it has nothing yeah, she to started do making bed. murals, basically. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and um, if I may on that point, um, I'd like to ask uh, a final question that com that's coming through, because I think this also speaks to the G's Bend difference too, um, which is, um, could both of you speak to the difference between working collectively or working in solitude? It kind of touches on both the communities, yeah. I Roberta? can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'll I, just read, yeah, go ahead. I think genius is, is equally possible. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be just one person and one person's drive and ambition. And it can be another, it can be in different uh, groups of people. You know, particularly if it's essential, like if you have a rock and roll band, you can't have a rock and roll band with one person, you know, that's a essential collaboration. And I think something like that happens in quilting, although I don't know, but where you have people doing like piecing or even just making the, 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 the squares. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I saw in one of the comments in the chat that in some cases, the people in the, the quilting circle would sing together. And you could imagine that a group of people who were piecing and singing that some kind of collective energy infuses the work. Rosie Lee Tompkins did work alone uh, and you know, maybe relatively un unusual in, in the quilting culture for that reason. Um, and you know, I think her work was a conversation with God in her, in her mind. So she didn't maybe think she was alone. And again, the works were addressed to particular people. So there, is a way in which the work was in a kind of a dialogue, but she, she, you know, I don't know why she worked alone. Uh, maybe she was shy or just felt she was more inspired by herself, but that is how she worked. Well, in part, I think it's a level of ambition that she, mm -hmm. and I, but I also think, as I think you said, and maybe somebody, maybe Elaine said it in the catalog that there was also a therapeutic aspect of her quilting. Mm -hmm. In exactly. other words, she made, she, she worked most intensely after she had had a nervous breakdown mm -hmm. in the 70s, I think. So that's why you go back to the 80s. And it, I think it really became her lifeline mm -hmm. that quilting was something mm -hmm. that was, a, you know, an absolute necessity. Yeah. 
urgent as to use your word from before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, thank you both. Um, I'm just noting the time. So it is 102, which is sort of our appointed hour has ended. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for, in, in, for being in attendance for your participation. Um, and also thank you very much, Larry Rinder and Roberta Smith for joining us this afternoon. It's been a real pleasure to see you both. Likewise, thank Thanks you for so having much, me. Bye, All right, have a good afternoon, Bye. everybody. Yeah, Larry, great to see you guys. Bye. <laughs>